Okay, the scripture for the day is, first one is Malachi 3, 6 to 7, found on page 950 on the Pew Bible. I am the Lord, I the Lord do not change, so you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Even since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees, and you have kept them. You have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you asked, how are we to return? The next reading is Hebrews 13, 1 to 8, found on page 950. No, no, 1194, I'm sorry. <laughs> Keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterers and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can a man do to me? Remember your leaders who speak the word of God to you. Consider the, outside, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The next scripture is found in James 1, 16 to 18, page 1196 in the Pew Bibles. Do not be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a, a kind of first fruits from all he created. Thus ends the word, reading of the word of God. Thank you. Can we be in an attitude of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would use me as your vessel to speak to your people here this morning. Help us to meditate on what you have to say, Holy Spirit, even if it's hard to hear sometimes. I pray that we would take it, think about it, chew it over, and then live it. Because that's what you call us to do, Lord, as Christians. And so we just thank you so much for all your blessings you pour on us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. How many of you like change? Raise your hands if you like change. <laughs> Tina, you had your hand raised. Why do you like change? It's exciting. Okay. Yeah, good things can come out of change. Now, most of the congregation did not raise their hands. So either they're not participating or <laughs> they don't like change. And so why don't you like change? Dave, why don't you like change? You don't mind change? It keeps a life interesting. <laughs> but with somebody else, why don't you like change? Go ahead, Brenda. Say it again. You learn more knowledge, okay? Well, basically with change, sometimes bad things come out of change. See, change usually happens in one of two ways. It either goes from good to bad or from bad to good. And we can see this, for instance, in what we're celebrating tomorrow, which is Independence Day. We went from bad to good because we went from being a people that was under the rule of Britain to being a people that are free. And so that's something good that we can celebrate. Another thing that we can celebrate is somebody being saved 
by God for the very first time. And I can attest to that. I was once lost, but now I'm found. And so that's something to celebrate. That's something going from bad to good. But on the other side of that, we have things that go from good to bad. And when I say that word, going from good to bad, some of you might already be thinking about the world we're living in. As it seems like it's going from good to, bad to worse, day in and day out. But when I think of going from good to bad, I think of one word, leftovers. Leftovers. How many of you know what leftovers are? We all know what leftovers are. We've all gone out to eat or we've made a meal at home. And we took our leftovers and we stuck them in the fridge. Now, a week goes by and we stick other things in the fridge as well throughout that whole entire week. And that leftover kind of got pushed to the back of the fridge. And then three weeks go by. And that meal has been going from good to bad to worse because it's rotting in the refrigerator and it's beginning to grow mold and it's beginning to smell and that smell is seeping out of the container it was once in and it's filling up your whole entire refrigerator and you go up to that refrigerator one day, open the door and that smell comes out and smacks you right in the nose, and you're like, whoo, something is rotting in here. And so you begin to root through the fridge trying to figure out, and it's, we all begin to become bloodhounds trying to figure out where it is, where's the food. So we're looking around for the food that's rotting, and then we finally find the culprit. And then we do something, and I don't know why we do this, because I do this too. It's like when we find it, we don't believe that this is definitely the food that's rotting. We pull the container out, and then we crack it open to be like, is this really the stuff that's rotting? And that when we do that, it almost knocks you off your feet. <laughs> but that's something going from good to bad. In either case, change happens, either for the good or for the bad. But we need to be careful that we don't take, impose that limitation upon God, as our God is immutable. Now, how many of you have ever heard of that word immutable before? Yeah. Could anybody tell me what that word immutable means? Go ahead. Not changeable. And that's what God is. He's not changeable. He never changes. He always remains the same. And that's who our God is. You wouldn't want to change something that is 100% perfect, would you? Because our God is 100% perfect. But it tells us that God never changes. That's what the word immutable means. God never differs from himself. And if we open our Bibles to the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 6, so if you want to turn in your Bibles to there, you may do that right now. And we're just going to read the first half of that verse. And it says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Meaning God is not held to any standard or limitation as his creation. As all of his creation changes at some point in time. Nature changes. We see it. In the trees during the fall time as the trees turn brown and they fall off, the leaves fall off. And we see it in the spring as they bloom again. We see it in humans. We were all, at one point in time, cute little drooly babies. But then we grew up to be independent adults. But the point is, is that God never changes. He never goes from good to bad or from bad to good. Because, as I said before, he's 100% perfect. As God is the apex of perfection. So not only does his perfection never change, so do all the rest of his attributes, such as his justice, his love, his mercy, his grace, his goodness, 
among all the rest of them never, ever change. They always remain the same. And now we could leave it right there. That could be the shortest sermon I've ever done, Charlie. Right there, good. <laughs> but we could leave it right there. But I'd rather look at three areas in which we can see God's immutability present, beginning with his word, as God's word is unchangeable. And we, we turn in our Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 8. We read, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Then we jump to the book of Numbers, chapter 23, verse 19, and we read, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? What these verses are saying is that God's word never changes, just like God never changes. Anything that God has said still holds true to today. And we can see this in Scripture. If we look in the Old Testament, for example, God made promises throughout the Old Testament. And one promise that he, we see definitely fulfilled, and this is just one of many, is Jesus Christ himself. See, God doesn't lie. He doesn't make promises and then totally forget about them. He fulfills them. And Jesus Christ laid claim to this himself when he said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So G G Jesus fulfilled that promise. And so that's proof, one of many proofs, that God's word never changes. It didn't change from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and it doesn't change from the New Testament to today. It always remains the same. The second area that we can look at God's immutability is in his plans. God's plans never change. If we turn in our book, Bibles to the book of Psalm, chapter 33, verses 10 through 11, we read, The Lord spoils the plans of the nations. He thwarts, thwarts the purposes of the people. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. This means that no king, no ruler, no nation, no government can ever change the plans of God. Nothing can ever change the plans of God. And that should be comforting news to each and every one of us that have put our faith in God. Especially as we look around this world and we are living in a world that is constantly changing all the time. But God never changes. So this should be, as I said, comforting news. However, there may be sitting somewhere here today someone that might hear these words and not find as much comfort as the rest of us do. And that might be because they've had a loved one that died tragically. And so instead of sitting here feeling comforted, they find themselves sitting here asking the question, why? If God is in control, if God is, has his plans laid out and they never change, how could this be a part of God's plan? A few years ago, when I worked at Jack's Building Materials, I remember talking to a guy I always shared my faith at work with, the people I worked with. And I remember talking to him and saying to him something along the line that, I don't understand how people can't believe in God when there's so much evidence to prove that God exists. What I didn't understand at the time is the pain that he was dealing with inside because he just lost his son. And that's when he looked at me with that pain in his eyes. And he said to me, if God is so wonderful, how could he allow this evil 
How could he allow this sickness to torture my son and then kill him? Sometimes we don't always have the answers. And something I've learned over the years, sometimes it's just better to be quiet than try to win a theological debate. And if that's you this morning, I'm going to pause here in a minute. If there is somebody here this morning that feels exactly that way or is listening at home, my heart goes out to you. I'm sorry for your loss. I truly am. And I pray that God will bring healing to you and will bring comfort, the same comfort that we all feel when we hear these words. But in the meantime, and I say this a lot at funerals, God is providing for you right now. And if you look around the room, that's what God's providing. Because we're family. We're here to listen, to be a shoulder to cry on. And so if that's you, use us so that you can come to that point of healing. But going back to what I was saying, the truth of the matter is evil exists in our world. It isn't from God as some might think, as evil is the absence of God and God is 100% good. However, God sometimes allows these bad things to happen. Why? Sometimes you can spend a whole eternity asking that question, why? And never find the answer. However, there is hope. In the midst of your pain and agony, there is hope. In the midst of your anger and despair, as God can bring good out of the most horrible circumstances in our lives, and we see this being referred to in James 1.17, where he says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. In other words, God always brings good to every bad circumstance. If you don't believe me, look at the life of Joseph Betrayed by his brothers, thrown into a pit, then sold. And later on, then he was accused of seducing Potiphar's wife and thrown into jail for a very long time. But God still brought good out of his circumstance. Look at Job. Lost everything. But in the end, God still provided still brought good out of his circumstance. As our God is always good. There's something we need to understand when it comes to God's immutability. And that is if God does this for Joseph, he's done this for Job. And he's done it for many other examples throughout the Bible. He will do it for you. Because our God always remains the same. With that being said, let's move to our third area in which God never changes, that being his salvation. Since the beginning of time, God laid out the plan of salvation. And in that plan, God predestined those who would follow Jesus. And we see this in the book of Romans 8, beginning with verse 29, where we read, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Since those whom God predestined are also called, justified, and glorified, we can be sure that nothing could separate them from the love of God and Christ. 
The same is true for each of us. If you have been saved through faith and grace in Jesus Christ alone, you could be rest assured that you will never fall out of favor with God. As Dr. Steve Lawson once said, the group that God began with in eternity past is the same group that God will bring together in eternity future. His plan of salvation never changes. Next week, we're going to be talking about God's omniscience. But the reason I'm bringing that up right now is because I want to address something here about God's omniscience. And that is, God's not surprised by anything. Eli, you could walk down the street today, turn the corner, and get the biggest surprise of your life. But God never turned the corner and got surprised for the simple reason that God already knew what was around the corner before he turned it. He knew what lay there before he found it out, as our God is all-knowing. The same is true when it comes to our salvation. God already knows before you're born who you will be, what you will be like, and what decision you will make when you are brought before the decision of salvation. God is not surprised by anything we ever do because he knows us. So he will direct your life to that goal of salvation and beyond, which is to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Now, many people struggle with this topic of predestination for many different reasons. But one of those reasons is because we have a loved one that we know is not saved. And I've thought long and hard about this, and it was sometime last year that this topic was talked about with uh, one of my mentors. And that was told to me through that conversation that when it comes to God's predestination, we don't know who's predestined and who's not. So if we don't know, and you've been praying for that loved one for some time, or you've been sharing your faith with that family member, hoping that one day they would open their eyes and see the truth, I encourage you to continue to do it, because God might be using you. He might be using you to direct that person to the goal of salvation. That's God's plan of salvation never changes. So with this being said, what does this tell us about ourselves in relation to God? Well, we've already said quite a bit about God's immutability and how it affects our lives, but the one thing that we can take away and find comfort in is knowing that God never changes in dealing with his creation. I believe A.W. Tozer said it best when he said, whatever God felt about anything, he still feels. Whatever he thought about anyone, he still thinks. Whatever he approved, he still approves. Whatever he condemned, he still condemns. As Hebrews 13.8 reaffirms, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we can take comfort in knowing that God's word still holds true today. That what God called a sin is still a sin. No matter how we dress it up. That it has not evolved as the world would want you to think and said God's word is truth and will remain that way yesterday, today, and forever. The same is true about God's plans. How many of you know that God has a plan for your life? All of us should have our hands raised because God has planned out each and every one of your lives. He knows what's going to happen. He knows as you walk out the door today what you're going to do. He's already been there. God is all-knowing. But when I was heard this when I first became born again, it, it gave me a sense of purpose. It gave me a sense of belonging because I didn't have to figure out in this crazy world what, where I was supposed to go or what I was supposed to do because God 
was in control. We read in Psalm 139, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways before a word is on my tongue. You, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. This chapter then goes on to talk about how God has known you since before you were born. Anything that God has ever felt about you, he still feels. He still loves you and cares about you. And he wants to be involved in your life and wants great things for you. The same is true for all his children. As God never changes, as his plans for you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Finally, God's plan for our salvation never changes, as I said before. We can be reassured that if we put our faith in Jesus Christ alone, we are saved. But maybe, just maybe, there's somebody here this morning that hasn't done that yet. Maybe you haven't put your faith in Jesus as, you, as your Lord and Savior. If you haven't, I do have a question for you. Do you think it's just a coincidence that you're here this morning, hearing this message? Because it isn't. God has been directing your life to this very moment. So, it's up to you what you will do next. Won't you invite him in? In closing, our world right now is currently full of turmoil and despair. But we have a God that is trustworthy and never changes. A God that has remained the same for all eternity. A God that loves you and will always love you. So if you find yourself struggling this week, put your faith in God who gave you the freedom that you can celebrate. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are just an awesome God. The more and more that we find out and discover each and every bit of knowledge that we can find out about you, just sets us in awe. Because you no matter what we've done, you love us and have forgiven us because of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would help us as we walk throughout our week, this coming week, to hold our heads high. Feel comforted because we belong to you, God, in a world that seems like there's really no hope anymore. We have hope in you. So help us to remember that the things we deal with in this coming week. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.